Thank you, thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. It is such an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you. Um, he took my introduction already. I was going to point out, it was such a privilege to sit in Dr. Bird's classes as a student of his years ago. Um, so those who don't know me, I didn't come from a Christian home. So I didn't have some church upbringing. I didn't start going to church until I was about 17 years old. So I would sit in his classes, and for some people, this was information they've heard over the years or taught. This was all new to me. So I was learning and just taking it all in, um, asking questions, sometimes a little more sarcastic than I should have been. But um, he forgave me, I think, over the years. And we've had some good times together, and I learned some amazing things at the school there. Then I did have the privilege, and I had Megan a little bit in the youth group, too, just like a small bit there in the youth group. But we had privilege with, with Carissa, and we got to go to Chance to on a Mexico missions trip. And um, it was a lot of fun there. And as I already mentioned, Emma's in her class, and Eli's friends with Karina and, and their class, and um, Mary studied under D Dr. Mrs. Bird. And um, <laughs> a, a, uh, we have just go back way, ba way back from many different ways, and now we're friends. And it's wonderful to be able to come here and share with you and be able to be at your church. And I've already gotten a chance to meet a couple of you, and uh, just love being here. And I love the community you guys have and the love you have for your community. So I asked, um, when Dr. Bird asked me to speak, he, I asked him, what are you guys talking about? What's been going on? And he said he's been through a series on holy habits. And I, I actually really love, um, I love reading books. I love reading books about habits. And there's so many cool books out there about that. And if you start reading and studying habits, you often realize that habits root from ultimately your worldview and, and the things and the thoughts you have and the processes that you go through and they define who you are and often your habits are built upon those. And today I want to talk a little bit about that and I want to talk a little bit about the worldview that you might be having and the proper worldview that you should have. And um, I actually remember when I was teaching a youth group years ago, I went through a whole series on your worldview and um, Dr. Kristen Bird had written that and helped us with that and that was a really great series that the kids got to go through. Um, got a little bit different per, um, perspective of that today, but I want to share that with you. And as we've been thinking about these last couple years, the world has changed so much in the last three years, whether it be through the pandemic, the, elector uh, the electoral back and forth, whether just people's worldviews, all the different things that have happened and taken place, we can often get very distracted from our vision, about our perspective, about our, what our mind should be, attention should be on. And there's a lot of distractions all around pulling us to different ways. Let me go ahead and share that. I could use that. I'm just going to probably click here. Um, and there's a lot of different things that are pulling our, our attention. And, and often they're not the right things. And we can get our eyes on the wrong things. And when we start getting our eyes on the wrong things regularly, we start acting out of character. Have you ever been that? been that in a spot, like distracted, so many different things going on that you notice you started acting and behaving out of character of what your worldview, what your core beliefs would normally have been. I've been there. I've been there quite a few times over the years. Um, just week, I, I, I apologize if I lose mic, lose sound, I walk, I move. So I'm a youth pastor. We don't stand still. That's where the history, because the other one, they'll fall asleep. So you got to do that. But as I think upon these last you know, years and different times in my life where I've lost perspective, where I started acting potentially out of character, sorry for the camera, but you'll find me eventually. Um, <laughs> when I think of different times, like even recently, I was working on my car. And if you've ever worked on a car, you know that there's a need for grace and love and, and you know, patience. Um, I'm not always great on love and patience when it comes to an automobile. And I was working on there and I was out in the garage by myself and um, even with the doors closed, I was about elbow deep trying to get something out from underneath the hood. And I'm pretty sure the family heard a few grunts and a few moans from the garage that were out of character. <laughs> and um, I, I've, I read before that said um, in an interview, someone asked, uh, candidate, they said, "Well, are, do do you do well under pressure? How do you handle stressful situations?" He said, "Oh, I'm I'm ready for this. I used to hold the flashlight for my dad when he would work on things, so I I know what it's like to work under pressure." Um, fortunately, none of the kids were holding a flashlight for me, so they didn't have to deal with the frustrations of what I was out there working on. But maybe other times when you're thinking with your with friends, and all of a sudden a controversial topic comes up, and something you have strong feelings about. Maybe on social media where there's a discussion about this or that. 
it's easy for us to get caught up in the day to day and caught up in the things that we disagree with or we don't necessarily like. And we forget about some of the things that matter most and we get our eyes off of the prize, off of our goal, off of the vision that God has placed in our hearts. And that's what I wanna share with you today in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 has become one of my absolute favorite chapters of scripture. Um, I've quoted it as actually really helped define my faith in many ways. I had to write a sermon in college about Romans chapter 12 and verses one and two, and, and that and def- um, profoundly impacted my worldview and who I was. Um, one of the verses I continued to go back to in verse two was the renewing of our minds. Um, this was a concept that, that over the years I've been developing and working on in my own, in my own life of when my mind's going down a path that ought not to, to retrain my mind to think upon godly things, things upon things the Lord's called me to. And that's one of the most transforming verses in my life. But today, I want to skip those two verses, and I want us to focus on the verses that follow that. And the, the verses are, we're going to look into Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 3 through 18. I'm going to read those out loud for you today. And um, please use your Bible app. It's a great, great tool. And um, I thought it was cool that he was sharing that today. It's something that I uh, encourage my kids to use and that we have we use at our, um, at our church as well. And it's, it's got a lot of features and a lot of cool things. I love the um, Bible in a year thing. You can go through reading plans. But I'm going to be reading here, um, starting here with verse 3. It says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. That's an interesting, I like that. This is a New Living Translation, but I like the way it comes out there. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts of doing things, certain things. So, if God has given you the ability to prophesy, prof- to prophecy, speak out with as so much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. If you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do so gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in this confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. And don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. I want to get that on a t-shirt. And don't think that you know it all. Never pay back evil for more, with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do that all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now, if you hear those verses, you're thinking, wow, we're going to be here till 2 in the afternoon to expound upon all the, the good truths that are found in there. I encourage you, um, well, I, I let you know, no, that's not going to happen. But I encourage you to lead those, study those, look into those more, because those that verses, that chapter, is far more important than anything I'm going to share with you today. But there's some great truth that we can walk away from with these verses here today. And what I'm going to share with you is what Paul was writing to this young Christian church telling them that they need to have a proper view, a proper worldview or vision of some important things. These truths now apply just so powerfully to our lives as well. And the first point here, let me get to verse two, a proper view of ourselves. Are you the type of person who evaluates yourself? Now, I'm not just talking about that quick look in the mirror to make sure that you you don't have any shaving cream still in your face. are you the person who takes a serious evaluation? Have you taken time to evaluate your own strengths, your own weaknesses? I'm not looking for answers here, but do each of you have, if the answer some questions, that if a close and personable friend, personal friend, someone you know very closely came to you and asked you these questions, would you have an answer for them? And just think about them. What is your greatest strength, your greatest ability that God has given you, that he has blessed you with? What is that? If you were to fall into temptation, what areas of your life would, be, would you most, vulner, most be vulnerable in? 
Are you living in all the light that God has revealed to you? That's not typically a question you have over a quick coffee with friends. But those are some things that we should be thinking about ourselves. We should wonder those and be prepared around those. Now, there is, if you, you can find many self-help help books out there, and there's some for about every topic in the world. And some of them are really good, and I've gained a lot of cool things out of them. Some of them are not worth their weight in salt. But there is something valuable in knowing what God has designed you to be, who you specifically are. We are all individually created in this beautiful design that God has for us. Paul wants us to have a healthy internal worldview of ourselves, and with that comes a proper dose of humility and self-respect. Oftentimes, you'll hear a lot of preaching on one side of this, and there is a great need for preaching out there for humility. But I'm not talking to you about that false humility. You know, where you have that friend and you're all around the campfire and you're like, Billy, come out, bring your guitar. We'd love to hear you play. It's like, oh, no, I'm actually quite terrible. No, 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 please, please, please. Finally, you convince Billy to come out there and you find out he's this trained professional and he's been traveling the world. He's absolutely amazing. I'm not saying that type of false humility. Um, but humility is a proper understanding of who we are through God's grace and an utter dependence upon him and that grace. But on the same idea of the cloth, there's those who don't need another reminder to be humble. There's many who have been comparing themselves to Christians for so many times over the years and continue to fall short from their own perspectives. They regularly look into the mirror and then they look onto others and they think of how worthless they might be, thinking that they can never measure up to so-and-so. That there's this one speaker, he's so good at what he does. Oh, she can sing so much better than me. Oh, this person can do such and such and so much better. And we can often feel very worthless and alone and very inadequate. But let me tell you today, that is not the case. For if you're a child of God, God has a special purpose and a plan for you, for your world, and what he wants specifically for you to do. On either side of the discussion, we must always view ourselves in the light of these verses here in verse 2, according to the measure of faith God has designed us, has assigned to us. So why should we ever consider ourselves higher, better, lower, or worse than someone else? God has given us the specific measure of grace and mercy that we need in our lives. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, we read, Do not compare ourselves with those who think they are good. They compare themselves with themselves. They decide that they think is good or bad and compare themselves with other ideas. And those things are foolish. It is our, it, if our measurement is other people, then we have a wrong measurement. We have a wrong, wrong way of measuring how, where we are in life. My wife has um, a favorite author of hers, her name is Ann Ballscamp, and if you've ever read any of her stuff, she does a very good job of writing. Um, but she wrote, comparison is a thug that robs your joy. But even more than that, comparison makes you, th makes you the thug who beats down your own soul. Ann Ballscamp, um, she wrote that. A phrase that I've heard and I've used a lot around work, you don't judge a fish by how well it climbs a tree. And you know, it's funny and it's comical, but yet we do that to so many people. God has designed you for a specific purpose, and you wonder why you can't do the purpose of the thing he's designed someone else to be and someone else to do. But he's put you in a different place, and we shouldn't compare ourselves that way. Your gifts may differ from those of your brother or your sister, but neither of them makes one better or makes them worse. To help with this, we need to realize that we are part of this body of Christ. The entire body. You are a part of the entire body. Each part looks different, and then each part has a different valuable role. One is not more or less valuable than the others. And honestly, none of the works, proper, works properly without joining and cooperating and working together. I've, um, there's things, I, I don't mind speaking in front of large crowds. I used to. I used to hate it. Um, I remember the first time I had to preach at GBS, and it scared me so much. Um, but I've gotten used to it. I actually don't mind. You tell me, you tell me I have a crowd of 500 people I'm not going to be overly anxious about. Um, and then even before, I used to be really anxious about the idea of small, speaking to small groups. So I've had a Bible study in my house for six, seven years now. Comfortable with that. But the thing I still to this day absolutely hate, if you told me, hey, we're going to knock on 200 doors over the next week, I would just dread it. I cannot stand the idea of cold calling, knocking on someone's door, and trying to talk to them. That is the most difficult thing in the world for me. And I used to be really bothered by that. I used to think, wow, I am just inadequate. I cannot do the things that so many of the other people do. I'd hear, I'd hear people like Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird can walk up to any random person on the street and Lay out the basic message of the Bible. I, that, that terrifies me, to, even to this day. That I do. I, I'll have those conversations, and we'll do those things when needed. But I realize that God's 
gifted me in other areas. There's areas that he's given me a calling to do that I'm comfortable with doing. Now, it doesn't mean God's never going to call you out of your comfort zone because he's going to do that from time to time. But if you're comparing yourself to Dr. Bird and your ability to uh, street evangelize, then um, you're, you're, you're going to fall short. and You're going to be very you know, weary in trying to think that that is the measurement that you have to live up to. And the next point comes really down to this conversation as well. A proper view, make sure I'm following along there, there's your, there's your uh, quote, a proper view of our roles within the church. Though as we discussed before, there is no expectation for everyone to be gifted or to everyone to have the same, or to everyone to be gifted the same way or to have the same abilities and talents. There is an expectation for everyone within your local church to be serving. There is an expectation to be involved and to be active. Let me say that again. God wants you to be involved and active in your church. He absolutely does. Paul proceeds to list a group of different roles and responsibilities within a church. He talks about prophesying and, and preaching. Now, this is a little slightly different than he gives the other ones, but he says in this one, do it according to the faith that has been given you. He says if you're going to serve, serve well. If you're going to teach, teach well. Encourage, be a very encouraging person. If you're to give, give generously. If you're to lead, lead with zeal and responsibility. If you're to show love, uh, acts of mercy, do so with cheerfulness and kindness. And the phrase is used over again here, do these things well, with zeal, generosity, with gladness, serve well. It was never God's intent for us to simply show up to church. There's no room for the lukewarm Christian in the body of Christ. Let's get back to this physical body comparison. If you aren't actively working, if you aren't actively being a part of the church, you're not just letting the church pass you by. And that was my thought for many years. If I just slip in the back and I never be a part and never serve in any way, that I'm just personally taking that. Like, that's nothing that's affecting the entire church. It's just me. But no, we're handicapping the entire church. For if your leg had a mind of its own one day and you decided to go out and do whatever it is you need to do, but that leg was not going to cooperate, you'd be walking around with a limp. You'd probably get along. You'd do some of the things you need to do, but you wouldn't be at your full capacity. If you're a part of the church and you are involved and active in some way, the church needs you to fulfill your role of the body. Now, once again, we are not all the same. We need to stop trying to push square pegs into round holes. There's no except expectation for everyone to preach. There's no expectation for everyone to lead in prayer publicly even, or even to sing. I remember was just a minute ago, Dr. Bird put this mic on me here, and he said, hey, you know, we're going to record this. I said, please have it muted during the singing time, because if it's recorded, it's just not, no one's going to want to hear that. And um, you go to like a blooper reel for the church. You don't, you don't need that. But God's called us each to our own specific abilities. If you're struggling with where you can be used, there's great tools out there. We live in a great day of technology. There are spiritual gifts tests where I ask you all these questions and it helps you decide where you're really good to serve. And um, just take a moment to think upon these things. Go and ask a godly friend. There's that same friend, you know, you might be closer and say, hey, you know me well. What am I good at? And that might seem like an awkward question, but what are some things that you see that I, I'm, I'm, I'm capable in? To talk, talk to your pastor, talk to other people who you know are godly people. And then here's another thing. See what is needed. I, a pastor, you'll, you'll, you'll floor him sometimes when you just go up to say, hey, what, what can I do in the church? Is there something I can serve, some way I can serve? And you'll find that sometimes that those things will fit right along to your skills and abilities. God has placed you here, and you're not here on accident. There is a place here at Carthage Methodist for you to be serving. And if you aren't serving, there is a U-shaped hole here at the church. If you aren't contributing, you are hindering the body. Now, that's not to guilt people. That's not to tell you that, but it's telling you that there's a reason you're here, and God has a purpose for you here in this church, and that's to serve in one way or another. Look at the phrase that one way or another, one another. Take a quick moment to Google that sometimes. How many times do you find that in, in Scripture? And um, we used to say, look up at a concordance. Now we say Google it, but concordances are still good too. Um, it's used 100 times alone in the New Testament. 47 different times Jesus used it when he was speaking to people. We are to love one another. We are to pray for one another. One another. We are to encourage one another. We are to sh um, and how are we to follow, as Jesus said, all the things that I've commanded? We can't claim that we're following Jesus if we neglect the church that he's created and that one anotherness that he's called us to. Let's get this straight. The church is not a social club. It's not a building, but it's also not an option. The church is active. It is a life-transforming body of Christ that we are called to be a member and a part of. 
What does that ultimately come down to? Possibly the greatest one another verse there is in Scripture when we read in John 13, 35. And by this, all people will know that you are my, dis- my disciples if you love one another. Which leads us to the third and to the, the final point. Now notice here, it says, um, a proper view of our expected love for others. Jesus wasn't saying to his disciples that you will be known that you love that you will be known that you serve me by the list of rules that you follow, by the years of college that you've attended, by the number of likes you get on Facebook, the political party that you subscribe to, or the way that you dress, or even the church you attend. But he said you will be known by your love for one another. Some of those other things are really important. Those are important things and are things to look into. But what you'll be known, what will stand out is your love for one another. That thought alone should shake us to our cores, and many of us, including myself, have gotten our eyes focused on the wrong things. And sometimes, and maybe now, is a time for a renewed vision. Straight out the gate here, in some of these uh, verses that he gives over and over on here, it says, we are to not just pretend to love each other, but to really love one another. And 10 says, love each other with genuine love that takes delight in honoring each other. If there is one thing that is glaringly obvious in life, is that when someone is fake. When someone is fake, you can tell pretty quick. And uh, and I'm certain that if we went around here today and we asked people, hey, do you know someone who's fake that you had a conversation with that was fake? You could probably think of some people who did that. But what does the type of love that we're looking about here look at? Well, in John 15, 13, we read, greater love than this. There is no greater love than this than someone to lay his life down for his friends. Genuine love is sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice for those around you? Your money, your possessions, your energy, your time? When we went to have that trip to Mexico, which I mentioned earlier with Carissa, I, I'm a person who I very much like things starting on time. It's, it's, um, it, it's something I've worked on over the years to be okay with. Um, I actually, uh, when I saw exactly 11 o'clock, you got up front there, I was like, there you go. Good job. I, I, I'm, I, I'm encouraging for that. If she got up at, you know, 11.04, I'd have been, okay, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> I wouldn't have said anything. But it's something I'm growing on and I'm working on. But um, as I've been developing that, many years ago, we went to Mexico and we went on a mission trip down there. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. The people were some of the most loving people there ever was. They were so loving, they didn't want to go to bed. Like, we would go out there and show up and we stayed up so late playing games. And I, you got to think, we flew for hours and hours and layovers and bus rides and all these crazy things and they wanted to hang out and play games and I wanted to sleep and not play games and so I, I, I got past that and that was that was cool and I was like oh they're very kind people and then I was told hey we're gonna you're gonna preach tomorrow morning and I have an interpreter and I've been going through and and pacing and praying and thinking and getting excited about to preach and we get out there and he said well church is at 10 o'clock so we show up at 10 o'clock and I'm, no, we, we, we show up about 9.30 and we're getting ready. And there's p- tons of people already there at 9.30. And I'm, I'm looking at my watch like, well, we're getting close. And it hits 10 o'clock. Nothing happens. I'm thinking maybe a bell is going to ring. 10.15, 10.30, 10.45. And then a few people just start occasionally meandering into the church building. And then they start playing music. And we're about an hour later. Now I thought, oh, I, I got messed up. I did the time wrong. I, you know, it must have been 11 when the service started there. Well, the same thing happened later that evening and the next day and the next day. And each time we had services, I realized, and I started talking to them. I was like, you know, I wasn't being rude. I was like, hey, you guys are late. You need to start being more like us Americans. No, I, I'm, I'm smart. I'm, I like to think I'm smarter than that. But I, I talked to them. I said, what, what, what's going on here? Like, you know, how, how does that work? And he's like, oh, 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 oh. And this is Brother Steve Stetler. If you ever met him, amazing, amazing man. But he kind of laughed with me and he was sharing. He's like, no. Here, relationships are a lot more important than starting on time. He's like, so they will just talk until they're done talking. And then when they're done with that, they'll just head on in and they'll have a time of worship. And that was completely strange and weird to me. You could have told me I had to eat a weird animal and I'd have probably been less confused than if I was told that. And I and worked through it and we, we learned. And I'm trying to do that more in my own life of taking time for people, taking the time just to, to talk to them. And to not be on that constant time constraints. Um, 
I, I tell you about those books, and I, I walk around, sorry, camera. I, I tell you about those, those books I like reading. And I remember reading in one of those books, they said you can tell when someone really enjoys talking to you. And you're going to remember this, because it, it, it really shook me, because I did it myself. So when someone enjoys talking to you, everyone's good at hand gestures and facial expressions, and they know how to smile, even though they don't want to be there. Um, you can get that. They said, but one thing people are not good at covering is their feet. Now, that sounds a weird thing, but your feet often tell more than you realize. If you're talking to someone and your feet are turned like this and you're like, uh-huh, 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 you can tell that person, if you're talking to someone and their feet are turned away, they probably want to go away. And, that, and I started, I read that. And now, I mean, that's not the case if you're that person who always talks at a 90-degree angle. It's great. Um, that, that, that doesn't mean you. But for me, that was true. And I started catching myself. Now, my question wasn't, like, my, my thought was, hey, I need to start looking better to people and make them not think. I started, I need to change who I am. I would talk to people at church, and I'd be doing this. I'm like, yeah, uh-huh, that, that, that's really sad, okay. And then I'd go off to my own thing. I learned, I, and I started to stop, like, John, your feet. So I'd square up, and I'd try to really listen, and I'd try to be a part of the conversation. Because listening to people is, oddly enough, you think, you think when you think loving people, your first thought is, well, I need to give them money. I need to do service around their house. Loving people sometimes is just listening to them. It's just hearing their story and what's going on in their lives. And sometimes the best way is to simply do that. When's the last time you sat down and just listened to someone? Once again, there's more than an act of just service, but it's a heart motivation. We need to take delight in honoring one another. Take delight in honoring one another. Um, I won't talk too much about it because I could talk way too long, but I love Celebrate Recovery. It's a ministry I've been able to be a part of. And you guys had Chuck Chapman speak here, and he's been, he, he's been a great help in all this. But one thing about Celebrate Recovery is, yes, we're there to help people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. But one of the biggest things is just to listen to people and to be there for them because they don't have anyone to talk to. Many people don't. So just taking time to listen to people. Over the next few verses, Paul lays out some great nuggets and nuggets of truth, the life-changing words here. Clear directives how to walk the Christian walk. Hate what is wrong. Sometimes when you require, I'm going to move through these quickly, but hate what is wrong. Sometimes it requires a renewed vision and understanding of God's word. Patience and tribulations. It's not, what, it's not the fall that defines you. It's what you do after you fall. You're going to face tribulation. You're going to face hard times. How, are you, how you handle those things is what can be what defines you. Help others in need. What does this look like? Maybe it's handing money to, uh, maybe it's handing um, some spare change to that homeless person. Maybe it's helping someone their move. Maybe it's just sitting there and talking to them like we discussed. God wants us to love people so much that we go to extreme measures to do so. Eager to practice hospitality. Often our homes are our sanctuaries. In some ways that's a good place, but sometimes we need to open them up and share them as sanctuaries for others. Happy to help. Um, happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who are in sorrow. Take time to celebrate the victories in the lives of those people around you, but also take time to mourn the losses. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Probably one of my favorite phrasings and ways it was written there. It goes right back to a proper review of ourselves. Don't think you know it all. One great lesson I learned over the years is there is not a single person in this world that I cannot learn something from. Everyone out there has an amazing story, something that they can teach you, and spending time and getting to know them, you'll learn great, amazing things about life. Finally, in verse 18, do all that you can do to live in peace with everyone. And the same thing in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Are we doing this? Are we doing all that we can to live at peace with others? A favorite quote of mine is, um, when given the choice between doing right or being kind, excuse me, to mean choose between being right or being kind, choose kind. does not mean that we have to support, support and condone other people's actions and views. But do we always have to get our point across? Do we always have to have the final word? Do we always have to prove that we're right, especially on trivial things? There are some things that don't really matter. If you like Ford or you like Chevy, there's a right choice, which probably Chevy in my opinion, but um, it's not in the end worth losing a friendship over, worth losing a relationship over. Stand firm what you know to be true about God and his holy word. But in matters of opinion, choose to be kind. Choose to be patient. And even when you are right, be right in a way that people can see God's love shining through you. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Almost 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote this letter to the young Christian church, telling them that they need to have a proper view, a proper vision of some important things, a proper view of ourselves, a proper view of our role within our church, and a proper view of the expected love we are to have for others.
this recalibrated focus is just, um, just as important for us to hear today as it was back then. So let us take time to view ourselves as God views us, to properly realize the grace that we've been given, and let us understand the importance and the need for participation, involvement in our church. And finally, let us love people the way God intended for us to love them. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the directive we've got from Scripture here. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves in the light in the way that you see us. Help us to see others in the light and the love that you have for them. Help us to be active and, and serving and whatever that might look like, from, the, from, from speaking and sharing to, to taking out